that sign of the times is that the Messiah is here. Don't mistake that to be a, talking about giving signs for when the second coming is. He heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath. This brings forth again fury from the Pharisees. Um, he then gives instructions to his disciples in the nature of, uh, or in light of the coming kingdom, that basically the the emphasis here is evil, a little evil can destroy a whole lot of good inside the church. And that his disciples ask him, well, who's going to be saved? Jesus tells them, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Few that there be that go in thereat. And that's because in human nature, we want to feel like we're good. People like to work their way to heaven. That's human nature. People want to be good enough to enter heaven. Well, no one is good enough person only enters heaven by admitting to God that they're a sinner and accepting God's salvation. But human nature wants to be good enough to earn something, to deserve something. That's why you'll see cults grow and become hugely rich is because people don't mind giving if, it, if they're a good person because they give. That's not why we give at this church. The reason we give is to glorify God. You could give a hundred million billion dollars inside the offering plate and it wouldn't make you one bit a better person. It really wouldn't. You could give the entire world full of gold and it wouldn't make you one bit a better person. Um, we don't give to become better people. We give out of obedience to God and glorify God to be a service to further the ministry of the church. We don't give because we're good. It has nothing to do with it. We don't get any brownie points for uh, loading the offering plate up. And uh, that's something which goes against human nature. Human nature wants to feel like it earns something, like it deserves heaven. We don't deserve heaven. But um, that's why few get saved. A second confrontation with the Pharisees. Jesus eats at the Pharisees' house. He heals another person on the Sabbath. They're upset. I, I find this interesting. The Pharisees invite Jesus over to eat on the Sabbath. A sick man comes in, a crippled man. Jesus heals him and they get upset about it. They can eat on the Sabbath, but you can't heal someone. That's how people get when they turn from the Word of God. Running out of time, but uh, moving on. Instructions in the discipleship in the light of Jesus' impending death. Discipleship costs all. Even our family, even our closest ties, our lives shouldn't interfere with service. Jesus says, Whosoever cometh after me and hateth not father and mother, wife, children, and his own life also cannot be my disciple. It doesn't mean we're supposed to hate people. But what it means is nothing should separate us from service to Christ. Luke chapter 14. He gives parables about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. This tells us the heart we're supposed to have about the lost. We're supposed to seek them until they come. He gives a parable then about the unfaithful steward. We're supposed to value eternal things is the point of that. Um, the people of this world, they value money. We're supposed to value eternal things. And if we're not faithful in that which is small, we won't be faithful in that which is great. We can't serve two masters. Either we'll love the one or we'll hate the other. We'll hold the one and despise the other. We cannot serve both God and money. Continued instruction of the disciples. Jesus talks to them about, uh, if you'll see under uh, point three, the whole lesson here is faith versus self-reliance. You go ahead and jot that down next to it. Faith versus self-reliance. For sake of time, I'll skip the whole point. But understand that faith versus self-reliance is the whole key to that passage there. We then find Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He comes with great fanfare as the Messiah. He rides in on the colt. That was what he was prophesied to be doing. Uh, lo, the Messiah cometh, uh, lowly sitting on the foal of an ass, uh, sitting on the colt. Um, he comes in riding on a donkey, an unbroken donkey, one which had never been ridden on before. And uh, the people recognize Jesus as Messiah. Everybody's cheering for him. Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And as Jesus gets nigh to Jerusalem, Jesus begins to weep. 
chapter 19. Let me read it here. And as he came near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. And he then talks about how it's, the city is going to be destroyed. In their hearts, the people had already rejected Christ. They'd already turned aside from him. They wanted a Messiah who would deliver them from Rome, but they did not want a Messiah who would deliver them from their sin. They wanted to continue to live their own way, not God's way. We find religious opposition in the temple. Who are the people who had the rule over the temple? Remember from several weeks ago. Who had the rule over the temple? Pharisees. Pharisees, and uh, especially the Sadducees were in the upper crust of the temple. They were the upper crust. The Pharisees were the ones who did a lot of the teaching in the temple. Sadducees, um, Ananias and Caiaphas were both Sadducees. We, you don't find this so much in the Bible. This is from our intertestamental history we just uh, studied a few weeks ago. The Sadducees had the highest positions often. The Pharisees were the ones who were in charge of a lot of the smaller things inside the temple. And the Pharisees also were in charge of the synagogue. And uh, we see both the Pharisees and the Sadducees plotting against Jesus. Pharisees and Sadducees are desperate enemies. They join hands to plot against Jesus. Well, the death and resurrection of the Son of Man, uh, Roman numeral 7, he's betrayed by Judas at the Last Supper. He holds the Last Supper for his disciples. Judas is sent off. Judas sneaks off, betrays him, and they come, they arrest Jesus. They hold a, a fake trial, a mock trial, really. He's convicted of the Jews for claiming to be the Son of Man, for claiming to be exactly who he was. They rejected all his proofs. They'd already rejected them long before. He goes to trial before Pilate, says, I find no fault in him. He sends him to Herod, who mocks him, who sends him back to Pilate. Pilate wants to clean his hands of Jesus. And uh, basically the Jews tell him, if, if you set Jesus free, then you're not Caesar's friend. You're um, against Caesar. So Pilate basically says, well, do whatever you're going to do to him. And, set, and uh, releases him, orders his crucifixion. Jesus is crucified, a Roman death, but at the hands of the Jews, typifying that all men are guilty before God, both the Jew and the Gentile. The... And on the eyes of this world, both the righteous and wicked, everybody in this world, the good and the bad, the rich and the poor, everyone had his hand in the crucifixion. Everyone pounded the nails in. Everyone whipped Jesus. Jesus died for every man at the cross. Well, the resurrection of Jesus, Luke gives several witnesses to the credibility, the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus died and didn't rise again, we'd be in horrible trouble, and there would be no Christianity. It would be a meaningless, pointless religion. So Luke gives witnesses. The women at the tomb provide testimony. Peter does. The disciples on the road to Emmaus do. The disciples gathered in the upper room, the twelve apostles minus Judas, see Jesus in his resurrected body. They see the scars. They see him eat honeycomb and fish. And... Jesus gives them the great commission, the command to witness, and the promise for power. He tells them to go out, carry the gospel of the world. He promises them, wait right here now for power from on high. He then ascends into heaven. And uh, the book of Luke segues into the book of Acts. The point of the book of Luke is, the things Jesus did, we can do too. Not so much in regards to the miracles. The miracles were just the authentication of his ministry. The miracles really weren't... Uh, the miracles aren't what Jesus' ministry was all about. What Jesus' ministry was really all about was a proclamation of God's word. He came not to the righteous, but to bring sinners to repentance. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. God hasn't called us to work miracles like Jesus did. That wasn't the thing he's called us to. He's called us to bring the gospel to the world, and that's something God has empowered us to do. God has called us to live an abundant life, to live in spiritual victory. We can have spiritual victory just like Jesus had. The life Jesus had, he lived, that is a life we can live too. It's, um, 
shouldn't be 